I wasn't quite sure uh, which was worse, uh, speaking just before lunch or speaking just after lunch. Uh, I guess we'll find out. Uh, when Camden was introducing uh, uh, Brother Clary and his uh, address, he said he, I think he said something like he was especially looking forward to uh, hearing uh, Glenn's uh, address, and, and I leaned over to Jim Cassidy and said that meant that he wasn't especially looking forward to ours. <laughs> the logical conclusion that one must draw. <laughs> and then someone else suggested that I just read the title of my address and then ask for questions. <laughs> uh, and one other thing, one other thing before we begin, uh, and, and that is that uh, there are some of us here who uh, are wearing bow ties, at least at one of the sessions, if, or one of the days, if not all of them, and we want to submit a formal protest to the moderator about those tie tacks. Oh. Tie tacks all are, by definition, um, exclusionary. They are discriminatory against those of us who are wearing bow ties. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, so this morning, uh, we have to have some humor. God does love humor. Not stupid jokes, but insights into the, our humanity. Okay, good, good point. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. We wanted interaction and we're getting it. All right. This morning or late morning, I hope to make the case, beloved, that we ought to follow the traditional Reformed understanding of the doctrine of the image of God in man is augmented by more recent thinking on the topic. Now, my stress isn't going to be on the augmentation, per se. It'll be on the traditional Reformed understanding of the doctrine of the image of God, the imago dei in man. In other words, I will argue for an expansive definition of the imago dei rather than a more narrowly focused functional definition. Uh, that is uh, something that is typical, uh, at least in the last hundred years or more, uh, in commentaries that address the image of God, for instance, on, on the Genesis or uh, on the book of James, uh, wherever the image uh, language appears and the concept appears. The thrust of my argument can be boiled down to this. In order for human beings to reflect the image of God, it must be the case that there is both an ontological and ethical foundation in place by God's covenantal, providential, and eschatological constitution. With this constitution in place, then the image can function properly. Uh, with an eschatological thrust, I should add. It'll function properly to our triune God's glory. Our brief study uh, this late, after, late morning will involve uh, historical, biblical, and systematic considerations, but this will not be an exhaustive, but merely a suggestive study. It will not be loaded with citations, and I must explain to you why that's the case. Uh, I was going to be filling in my citations after the fact when my computer gave me trouble and decided to act up. So I will try to insert uh, in my notes uh, where I think an appropriate reference to another theologian fits uh, just so you wonder why, oh, Jeff didn't do his research. He's just flying by the seat of his pants. Well, which may be true anyways, but. So the state of the question, 
in, in uh, the Middle Ages and then on into the post-Reformation, Reformation and post-Reformation era. Uh, the scholastics, whether they be the Roman Catholic scholastics or the Reformed scholastics or the Lutheran scholastics, always talked about the state of the question. That is, what, are the, what is the thing we are looking at? What is the subject that we are considering? So here, uh, I just want to note that the church has wrestled with properly understanding the nature of the image of God for as long as uh, the church has been around. And I, I would include in that, of course, the Old Testament church as well. Our question is not a new one. The church in its New Testament stage has had for over 2,000 years has had uh, been able to think about the image of God and uh, has offered different answers, some of which we discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, if you were here for the uh, uh, recording of the live Christ the Center episode, you will have heard some of those. Understand that those were generalizations, whether it be the Roman Catholic uh, Lutheran or the Reformed. There are variations within those general categories. And if we got into those general, got into the specifics, we would be here for years. More recently, a, uh, a scholar by the name of John Kilner, who's a professor, uh, the foreman chair actually, of Christian Ethics and Theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is in some place called Deerfield. Uh, in Illinois, uh, I think it's near here, to our south, if I remembered seeing the sign. Uh, he is a bioethics scholar of no mean ability. And he has uh, written and published uh, a new volume, which is uh, perhaps going to be the seminal uh, book on the topic, and it's called Dignity and Destiny. Now, I'm not uh, concerned here to uh, offer a review of that book, although that may come, so I guess be on the lookout for that down the road. I simply want to note that this is a topic that is generating interest uh, and uh, some controversy, as we learned yesterday. Uh, Kilner's book is described as a magisterial, comprehensive, and engaging, richly documented, and the most exhaustive study of the doctrine of the image of God. So you, you understand that this is a, a work that uh, we ought to look at. Agree, disagree, or partially agree, disagree, which is usually where I end up. This work must be reckoned with in any future consideration of the image doctrine. I just mentioned that in passing, is that, that a brand new book, relatively new book, is addressing our topic. And in fact, he, he will argue against my position. Uh, so someday I will respond uh, to him in more detail. For our purposes, we, consider the, we can consider the history of the church's understanding of the image doctrine along the following lines. Early on, the uh, church considered the image of God uh, as constituted or constitutive of what human beings are, what we are. More recently, as I've said, among biblical scholars especially, the image has been understood to be functional. It is something we do. Now, I suggest that the image ought to be understood in three mutually interrelated ways as ontological, ethical, and functional. So all three are involved, and that's why I said earlier that I would be arguing for an expansive doctrine rather than a minimalist doctrine. Those of you who know me know that, that expansive is a Good way to think about me. Yes, that was, you can laugh. And shrinking, and shrinking right. That's, uh, all three ways, all three ways, ontological, ethical, and functional, are suffused or permeated with the covenantal, eschatological, and redemptive context in which we human beings have been created and placed. 
Uh, I'm going to try to look at each of these facets, so I guess that's six areas, thinking about the ontological, ethical, and the functional in the context of creation, providence, and redemption. In other words, our consideration of what the divine image entails ought not to be flat or abstract. I, I hope you share with me the high esteem and high estimation that, we, that I have of the previous lectures. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tipton's lecture last night and then Dr. Cassidy and, and uh, Dr. Clary's uh, lectures and then I trust the same will be true for those that that follow from Dr. Busey and more from Dr. Tipton. Uh, rich in biblical and theological description and exposition. And so uh, you will see that uh, we overlap, uh, we complement one another, and I trust that will continue. Uh, I must confess as we move into a consideration of the divine image as ontological, ethical, and functional, I must confess that my argument is for a return to an older way of understanding what it means to be a human being and how we are constituted as such. The Reformed scholastics understood our humanity to involve our substance, habits or dispositions, and specific acts. Okay, so if we're going to consider, if we're going to consider human nature or what it means to be in the image of God, we need to consider us as human beings under those three categories. Uh, it's related to Aristotle's distinction between substance and accidents, uh, but it's uh, not exactly the same. So substance, habits, and acts. Uh, and this is a, this is a, a dis these are distinctions that will play uh, significant roles in the history of the church. Just to give you an example, you may have seen a book that Banner of Truth put out a few years ago called Princeton versus the New Divinity, which was basically uh, a gathering together of articles from the old Princeton uh, Review, uh, uh, Princeton and Presbyterian Review, or Presbyterian and Princeton Review, the Biblical Repertory, all those theological journals that old Princeton put out. Uh, begun by Charles Hodge. Uh, back in the uh, mid-1800s, there was a, a real debate raging over uh, Charles Finney and his uh, second uh, Great Awakening that he was involved with. Uh, Finney himself denied uh, original sin, arguing that uh, we imitate Adam, we don't have a sinful nature. And into that discussion spoke the various members of the faculty of Princeton University and uh, what was, would become Princeton University and Princeton Theological Seminary. And they uh, especially used the idea of habit to address th that particular problem. And I'll explain in a moment how that works. The distinction, as I've said, between substance, habits, and acts uh, can be traced back to Aristotle, Although I would, I would argue that it would be debatable whether Aristotle would recognize the Christian use of his ideas, this is not insignificant. As a Vantillian, I want to make sure that whatever uh, aspect of truth uh, that we gain from a, a non-believing source, a pagan source, that that twisted truth, to use the language of Scott Oliphant in his book, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, that twist, we want to make sure that twisted truth is untwisted. Um, so we're not just adopting or taking over whole a pagan idea into uh, Christian theology. We want to be very careful about that. But in this instance, I think that that um, uh, cleaning house, if you will, or that baptizing or that uh, straining out the, the sinful elements, the pagan elements, has been done. When we talk about our common human nature, we are talking about what constitutes the divine image. 
what is the divine image. So as we consider our common human nature, we are really be talking about what it means to be in, made in the divine image. And that has to be considered, as I've already said, in the context of the unfolding of covenant history, beginning in the Garden of Eden and finding its consummation in the Garden City of the New Jerusalem. And I would argue uh, back of that would be the covenant of redemption, etc. cetera. Uh, behind that, the, uh, we think of the covenant of works and the covenant of redemption, or the covenant of grace, but there's also, I believe, a covenant of works between the three members of the Trinity where the planning of redemption is uh, mapped out. So our consideration of this topic, these issues, is not to be considered, beloved, uh, abstracted as if they're free-floating philosophical concepts, but they are grounded in God's uh, gracious creation uh, and redemptive the providential and redemptive activity. We humans are created in, as created in God's image, are comprised of human substance, dispositions, or habits. We might some refer to them as inclinations or desires, tendencies. Uh, in, the, in the academic literature, uh, these are usually referred to as habits or dispositions, but they mean inclinations or desires. Uh, and acts, behavior that flows out of the human heart. And they find their convergence uh, in our substance and habits. The substance of our humanity, speaking in general terms, involves the fact that we are psychosomatic unities, psychosomatic unities. That is, we have bodies and souls that, are, that mutually interpenetrate and interact with each other or as some of the older theologians would have said, that the uh, soul uses the instrument uh, or the body as its instrument. I'm not sure that I'm quite happy with that way of talking, uh, but uh, there is an element of truth there. But I would say that, that uh, uh, our bodies are not incidental to our uh, human nature. We see this, this interpenetration of the body and the soul, the psychosomatic unity, uh, when we have emotional stress, which gives rise uh, to a skin rash. Uh, one, of, one of my daughters uh, has this problem when, when she's uh, stressed out by a, a paper uh, that a professor is requiring or that um, that a test that may be coming up, uh, she will often break out in hives. Uh, and, but, but that's all based in an emotional uh, res uh, anticipation of, of uh, or the building up of stress. And this is one example of the interrelatedness of bodies and souls. We don't want to be guilty of, of uh, the bifurcation of the body and the soul that, uh, that uh, the philosopher Rene Descartes uh, has bequeathed to Western philosophy. When we talk about the heart or soul or personality or even the human mind, beloved, we are talking about the soul. When we note that it is the human agent that thinks, wills, and feels, we are talking about the powers or the capabilities or the capacities, or to use the older language, the faculties of the human soul. This is not to deny the influence of the body on the soul. It works both ways. I gave the illustration of perhaps the influence of the soul upon the body, but it does work the other way around. If we are sick, physically sick, often that will impinge upon our emotional state. Uh, it can impinge upon our spiritual state. If we are physically ill, it could interrupt uh, communion with God, or it may interrupt our sense of the, our communion with God, may be a more accurate way to put it. Human beings are created by God with stable constitution. 
Human beings are created by God with stable constitutions. Uh, and that fact does not, is not undermined by the fall. Okay, that, that you can think about the implications of that uh, for all sorts of things. And we got into some of that yesterday in the Christ the Center uh, recording. We are created with stable constitutions. Uh, how is it that we, now that we're not, we're not created with stable constitutions in and of ourselves. I am not saying that we are self-sustaining. What I'm saying is that God constitutes us. The Lord constitutes us with stable constitutions because if he didn't, how could we be held accountable for what we did a second ago, a minute ago, an hour ago, yesterday, last week, last month, last year? Okay, God constitutes us with stable natures or constitutions. Again, by saying this, we are not denying the fall or redemption. Rather, we are noting that when Adam fell, to quote one of my esteemed professors, he was still Adam. Uh, Adam, uh, I asked that question uh, of Dr. Scott Oliphant years ago in a PhD seminar because a lot of my uh, fellow students were getting into thinking about the fall being ontological. Okay, because of the way we use the word nature, and I'll get into that shortly. Uh, and I was resisting that, and I asked him, I said, so, Dr. Oliphant, uh, is the fall ontological? It was a setup question. Uh, he said, uh, with his uh, inimitable Texas accent, was Adam still, still Adam? I said, uh, yeah, Adam, still Adam, okay. Well, that answered the question. It, it's and I'll say this momentarily that that he goes from fallen Adam to or or from from righteous Adam to fallen Adam, but he's still Adam. You understand that? That's what I'm talking about when I talk about a stable constitution. Okay, that's that's the important thing. God has created us as a unity of physical and spiritual substance in common parlance. We use the word nature to refer to this substantial constitution and the habits that we have. That's where there's some muddying of the waters. When we use the expression human nature, we may actually be talking about two different things. We may be talking about our uh, nature as uh, sta stably constituted as human beings, or we may be talking about our inclinations and desires. And, and that's, but that's how we talk. We might decide in a given conversation to m use a more technical definition, but understand that out in the real world, the expression human nature covers both our stable constitution and our desires and inclinations. Uh, so the word nature is referred to this substantial constitutions or the habits that we have that can be gained or lost. So that's where habit and acts share kind of the, the accidental uh, element. If you think back to Aristotle's uh, philosophy. And by the way, uh, the discussion of habits in Aristotle is found in his Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, if you're interested, the Nicomachean Ethics, you can uh, find that in your library, I'm sure, or at the seminary. And if you have Logos software, it is available. And through Logos, you can quickly search and find the discussions about habits. In philosophical and theological discussion, we typically, as I've already said, limit the idea of human nature to substantial constitution. God created us with the ability to reason, communicate, or relate along with many other capacities or potencies or abilities. The classic Christian tradition, that would be up until the, the time, I suppose, of the Reformation, the, the Western tradition at least, has seen these abilities as part of our uh, divine image. 
as part of the divine image. More recent scholars, as I've said, without naming names, prefer to limit the image to the function of, of uh, man either, uh, in the case of Karl Barth, man relating to, to woman, uh, and Bavink, I'm not, I don't have Bavink in view in this comment because he doesn't fit, uh, or uh, something that we do, dominion. Now again, uh, the image involves what we do as well as who we are, being and doing. So maybe that's another way to say what I'm trying to argue for, is that, that the image involves both being and doing. So more recent biblical scholars especially of uh, shying away from any metaphysical statements, which you know they're not actually able to shy away from. Because when you say there's, I, we can't, that, uh, for instance, uh, one who's a systematician has uh, argued in a, a recent uh, book that, that the Bible itself has no metaphysic, no ontology, so we have to uh, come up with one. Well, there is a metaphysic in the Bible. It's called God and his creation. God and creation. Okay, that's the basic metaphysic of the Bible. It's called the creator-creature distinction. You've heard that already several times. Uh, so we agree that, there, that uh, the functionality of the image is involved in what we understand the image to be. I am arguing that the functional understanding of the image is not a complete understanding of the image. Human beings must be able to think, communicate, and relate more generally to both God and our fellow human creatures. Okay, these are what I call preconditions for both the functions of habits and the production of acts that proceed, acts that follow from the exercise of a particular inclination or habit. Again, this is, this is an older language that we do not use, although we are, uh, we do understand the notion of a habit after a certain manner, and I'll uh, speak to that very uh, shortly. If God has not created us with certain substantial structures, and that's to borrow the language of Al Walters in his book, Creation Regained, and by the way, that's not to, that's not to uh, say that I agree with everything Al Walters says in that book or anywhere else. Simply saying that, that uh, his distinction between structures and directions is, is getting at some of what I'm saying here. God, if God has not created us with certain substantial structures which provide the foundation for the existence and exercise of habits, then no specific acts can be performed which evidence or manifest the image. There can be no explicit manifestation of the function of the divine image without the foundation of a stable constitution, is what I'm arguing. In other words, there can be no relating or communicating or ruling or exercising dominion or reflecting holiness and righteousness of the filial image in Christ without these substantial structures. In other words, no substantial structures, no function. No ontological image or no ontological aspect to the image of God, then there's no behavioral or ethical or functional aspect to the image of God either. Now, there is more that needs to be said. In addition to the substantial structure of our humanity, there is also what I've referred to as the habits or the dispositions. Uh, we are familiar with the common use of the word habit. Uh, a habit uh, is an ability or skill or capability uh, that one can develop. We all, that's how we often think of it, as a pattern of repeated behavior. Right? That's what a habit usually is. We have good habits and bad habits, uh, uh, holy habits, uh, wicked, sinful habits, 
Now, I am using the word here in a more technical sense, although, although it's not unrelated to the common use. So a habit is an ability or skill or capability or faculty to use the old language. Uh, it is a, and it comes, uh, and we can, we can come by this habit either one of three ways. And this is where we're getting back to the reform scholastics. And I would recommend uh, as a quick primer, volume one of Richard Muller's uh, Post-Reformation Reform Dogmatics, where he talks about uh, this, uh, these distinctions that I'm making here. Volume one of a four volume set by a prodigious scholar, again, not one who I always agree with, but one who must be uh, reckoned with in our understanding of an earlier generation of Reformed theologians. That's a hobby horse that I have uh, to the extent that uh, we don't have a right to, to the use of the word, the name Reformed, if we don't bear some resemblance, oh, image, to those who have gone before us who have that designation. There must be something uh, that resemblance between us, them and us. A habit can be innate or concreated. The Reform Scholastics prefer concreated because for them, innate uh, had implications of autonomy. I don't myself see that, but I'm not, I, didn't live in their milieu as much as I understand it. Uh, so they would prefer concreated. That means to be created with. Uh, that means you have it from the get-go. That's what I mean by innate, but there you go. Or a habit, so a habit can be innate or concreated. It can be acquired. That's the use that we're familiar with in common parlance. We uh, develop a habit. We acquire a habit. We uh, learn to eat properly, or to not eat properly, as the case may be. Um, drinking coffee, I, used, I say, is an acquired habit. I learned it beginning at the age of three. Um, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's stunted my growth. I used to say, I'm not overweight, I'm just under tall. So when we think of habits, we think of the development of patterns of behavior. And, and uh, then there is the final category, which is called infused habits. Infused habits, okay? That is, they, they are uh, infused into us. Don't get nervous, you've heard the word infused. That's in our standards, okay? Infusion has a proper place in the consideration of regeneration and sanctification. It has no place in a consideration of justification, but it is a perfectly useful and legitimate word with regard to regeneration and sanctification. Okay? So an infused habit is something that God gives. Okay? And something that God gives subsequent to creation. So regeneration. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit produces holy habits, inclinations, or desires. You discover upon coming to faith in Christ that you have a desire to read the Word of God. You have a desire to be obedient, to please the Father. I might add that if you find that you don't have these desires, that you need to talk with your pastor or if you are a pastor, talk to your fellow presbyters. Uh, so we see that, that, that habits can be innate, they can be uh, acquired, or they can be infused. Habits that are infused would include Adam and Eve's, uh, um, let me correct that, habits that would be innate or concreated. See, I, I detected an error in my manuscript that I didn't note before. Uh, habits that would be innate would be uh, Adam and Eve's created righteousness. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Tipton yesterday in the opening to his address last evening uh, noted from A. A. Hodge, and someone can check on this, but I think he used the word concreated in there. 
talking about the righteousness of Adam and Eve. In my dissertation on Jonathan Edwards' theological anthropology, I go into this a fair bit because it figures heavily in, in Edwards' understanding of Adam and Eve as created and then as fallen and then as recreated, regenerated and sanctified. The one of the, we, and this didn't come up yesterday, I was kind of surprised. One of the unique things about the Reformed tradition is, is that we believe that Adam and Eve were created upright, holy and righteous and knowledgeable. Every other tradition, Christian tradition, believes that Adam and Eve were created neutral. So, uh, in the fall, there was something uh, lost, something significant, uh, some significant damage was caused by uh, the disobedience of our first parents. It's this created righteousness, this, this innate or concreated habit. Listen carefully. It is the habit that has been affected directly by the fall. Okay, remember I said it was holy Adam and then it was a fallen Adam. It's still Adam and Eve, holy Eve, fallen Eve. We primarily speak of Adam because he's the federal head of the human race. So it's the, it's the habit that uh, has been uh, affected by the fall. That's why Van Til, Cornelius Van Til, you've heard of him. Uh, that guy from this general neck of the woods, Indiana, Michigan, uh, who said that the fall was ethical. And what he means by that is he means that the fall was habitual. That, that when we talk about a sinful nature, what we mean is a sinful disposition, a sinful habit. The holy habit or inclination or desire has been replaced by a sinful disposition, inclination, or habit. Infused habits would, of course, would also include such things as uh, our redeemed righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. The, in sanctification, um, there is a, a kind of a blending, if you will, of acquired and infused habits. The regeneration involves, uh, it's monergistic, of course, it's all on God's side uh, in, the, in the traditional sense. Uh, but sanctification is a, is a combination, uh, and you understand that, that the Christian life involves one of uh, Holy Spirit-inspired or Holy Spirit-wrought out or worked out human effort. We cannot shy away in our, our welcome desire to understand the utterly gracious nature uh, of justification, we cannot ignore the calls to obedience that are found throughout the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. And we think of sanctification both in its definitive, uh, positional, and uh, progressive aspects. Acts now, we've, so we've considered the, the constitution, stable constitution, and we've talked about habits, and that's what's affected primarily by the fall, is our habit or inclination, our desires. And you understand that. It's the desire, it's what attracts you, it's your orientation. Okay, the orientation, we are either oriented toward sinful self, or we are oriented toward God. We are only oriented toward God by grace, through faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is brought about through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Acts are fairly simple to understand, I think, after the discussion of the stable constitution and habits. Acts result from the convergence of our uh, substantial structures and uh, habits. That is, our potential ability is, is combined with an inclination to behave or act in a certain way 
and this yields specific, discrete, or specific uh, acts, different acts. And remember that speaking and thinking are acts. In other words, I'm, when I talk about acts, I'm not limiting acts to physical or kinetic movement. As Christians, we understand that we commit sinful acts because we are sinners or possess a sinful nature and therefore sin. And of course, I, as I mentioned earlier, talking about a sinful nature, uh, we're equivocating to a certain extent on the use of the word nature. So let's bring this heretofore abstract and arcane discussion into the context of the covenant of, or into the context of redemptive history. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God with the ability to think, communicate, and relate to God primarily and to one another and, of course, to their environment. Certainly being human, being in the image, involved our ability to understand our creator and our created environment. It involved our ability to communicate with God and with one another. It involved our ability to relate to God, one another, and our environment. You're beginning to hear repetition. Repetition is good for the soul and for the body. At creation, there was no alienation between God and our first parents. There was no alienation between our first parents or between them and the animals and the plants of the Garden of Eden. And we know from the biblical creation account in Genesis 1 through 3, or 1 and 2 to be more exact, that Adam and Eve were created in righteousness and holiness as well as knowledge. We get that understanding because uh, in the New Testament, in Ephesians 4.24 and Colossians 3.10, we're told that we are being restored, Christians, saints, are being restored in the image of God after uh, knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, if you combine those two passages from sister letters by the Apostle Paul. As Calvin pointed out, the, the, what, was, what is being restored was possessed by our first parents in the Garden of Eden. Our first parents were not created neutral, but with a propensity toward worshiping and glorifying God. They were endowed with certain holy habits. Now, if you're familiar with Jonathan Edwards, you'll know that he uses this language all over the place, but it's not invented by him. It's part of the Reformed uh, tradition which he inherited and which he would himself add to. Parenthetically, it's always interesting to read the scholars who are either non-Christian or who are non-Reformed who always attribute to Edwards to some creativity, which a little familiarity with the Reformed theological heritage would, it would, would uh, make a person aware of the fact that there is much in Edwards that is actually not of his invention, but is uh, inherited from uh, the, the broader uh, Western uh, Christian tradition, the broader Reformed tradition, as he told one of his, his uh, students, uh, theological students, ministerial students, uh, that his favorite theologians were Van Maastricht and Turretin. Turretin was really good for uh, polemical uh, theology, and that's, of course, the institutes of elenctic theology. The word elenctic means polemic. It's confrontational theology. Uh, Van Maastricht, who is being translated, by the way, it hasn't been available uh, except for a small portion on regeneration. It hasn't been available in English. Van Maastricht will be available within a few short years uh, from Reformation Heritage Books, I believe. And that'll be, that's a huge tome. It'll probably be several volumes. But that's what, what Edward says was his favorite theologian with Van Maastricht. To say that Adam and Eve had been created in true knowledge and righteousness and holiness is not to say that they were absolutely perfect in every way. Although I would say that they were certainly beyond Mary Poppins who said that she was practically perfect in every way. Uh, 
Our venerable covenant theology and its more recent cousin, Vossian biblical theology, remind us, and we heard this, we've heard this, uh, and it needs to be burned into our brains, okay, into our minds. Uh, that God intended for Adam and Eve to advance to a higher plane. The language that Dr. Tipton used was beautiful, um, utterly dripping in biblical imagery, uh, and very helpful in that regard. Systematic theology must also be always be listening to the deliverances of biblical theology and the other way around. They're mutually uh, reinforcing uh, disciplines, uh, and so we are reminded that Adam and Eve were not created and they were not intended to live in a period of probation forever. They, they, they were uh, intended, it was, it was meant for them to advance to a higher state of communion with God. Uninterrupted bliss, if you will. Before there was ever a need for redemption, God offered consummate eschatological, and folks, I never use the word, I rarely use the word eschatological in the pulpit, but there's no way to avoid it in this context, okay? Uh, and it's not because I don't like the word eschatological, it's just always having to define it. Um, but God intended for Adam and Eve consummate eschatological blessing and bliss to our first parents should they sustain their probation, which involved the prohibition. While in Genesis 2, 15 to 17, God's prohibition is stated in negative terms, the positive implications can be handily deduced, I would suggest to you. If the negative result of temporal disobedience is dying, you will surely die. That's what the Hebrew means. In other words, you will certainly die. If, if the, the eternal uh, results of the temporal disobedience is death, then surely the positive result of temporal obedience would seem to be eternal blessing. This is all before the fall. Okay, this is what is being communicated in the account of the relationship between God and our first parents in the garden before the serpent comes slithering in to tempt Eve and her husband. The eternal blessing would have been the end goal for which they were created in the first place. In other words, so when we're talking about a stable constitution and holy habits and acts that follow uh, adoration and praise of the triune God, these are created, the, these are things that are in place uh, prior to the fall. And that's why you will often hear, uh, and, have, and perhaps you have read it, that eschatology precedes soteriology. That's what that means. The covenant of works came before the covenant of grace. That God's intent, and we talked about this last year, if you remember the Christ the Center episode that we recorded, Dr. Tipton and I had a discussion about, the, about this. Now, now, subsequent to the fall, beloved, in order to reach the divinely ordained end goal, we must come by way of union with Christ. You've already heard that as well over this last uh, day. In other words, redemption achieves what God originally offered prior to the fall to our first parents. This means that the divine image has an inbuilt eschatological color or flavor, whichever you know, metaphor floats your boat. Okay, uh, it has an eschatological cast. Okay, if you like that better, that's that's fine. Uh, now there are other ways to come at this truth. Um, for instance, and this was done um, last night and today, uh, we can come at what I'm saying from a consideration of the Sabbath. We can come at this 
uh, from a consideration of the uh, covenant of redemption, works and grace structure, or as Dr. Tipton likes to say, architectonic structure of covenant theology or of biblical theology at its best. And it, at, at its best, it preserves the eschatological thrust of our being in the image of God. After the fall, Adam was still Adam and Eve was still Eve. There was no uh, metaphysical or ontological change. Adam did not become not Adam, and Eve did not become not Eve. The fall was in the realm of habits or dispositions. Now, it is true that the misery, the, the, the outflow of the, of the sin and misery does affect us health-wise, etc. But the fall as such, sin, as well as holiness and righteousness, are ethical issues. They're habitual issues. They are not issues of the Constitution. They're, they're about the use and direction of what God has created us to be. As I already said, Cornelius Van Til would typically say that the fall was ethical and not ontological. And what he meant, it was redemptive historical and it was habitual. It was related to the habits or inclinations or desires. We be, need to be a bit more precise here. Adam was holy Adam. That's not W-H-O-L-L-Y. That's H-O-L-Y. Adam was holy Adam at creation, and with the fall he became unholy Adam. However, things do get a bit complicated at this point, and you may be thinking, at this point? Now, you may be thinking it's been complicated the whole way. It becomes less complicated as you become acclimated to this way of thinking. I can tell you that. We affirm with the Reformers and the Reformed tradition, in other words, with the Bible, that in the fall that something of the divine image was retained as well as lost. And we talked about that yesterday, right, with regard to the passages that tell us that the image still remains, Genesis 9, 6, James 3, 9, 1 Corinthians 11. And the uh, image, uh, an aspect of the image was lost. And so the Reformed tradition has come to speak of a broader or a narrower image, uh, free agency or moral agency and moral excellence, to use uh, Professor Murray's language. And the broader image would involve the ability to reason, communicate, and relate, while the narrower image would involve the holy or unholy functioning of the image. Now, over against our Roman Catholic Friends, uh, we believe that uh, the broader image was retained but damaged while the narrower image was lost altogether. Okay, so the, the broader image, that is uh, reason, language, relation, uh, relationality, these things are affected. This is different from what we learned. Remember the, the doctrine of the superadded gift? or the donum superadditum, those of you who were awake during that conversation will remember that. Uh, that's, that's a big difference between the Reformed and Roman Catholics, and Arminians it tends to side with Roman Catholicism on this point. To put it another way, the fall caused a change in our habits or disposition. As there is a transition from holiness and righteousness to guilt and corruption, and correspondingly from God's favor to his wrath. And conversely, when we become the recipients of God's grace, regeneration and sanctification begin the reparation of the divine image and its substantial, habitual, and functional aspects. Definitive sanctification registers the principial break with the power of sin. And this occurs, of course, at Christ's resurrection. We've heard this. In positional sanctification, we are set apart unto God for his special purposes. Uh, 
These are radical and completely occur at the time that we are united to Christ by spirit-worked faith. Progressive sanctification occurs over the whole period of our lifetime as we are united to Christ and in increasingly dying to sin and living unto righteousness. At the consummation, when all the saints experience what was promised to Adam and Eve, beloved, in the Garden of Eden before the fall, in the covenant of works, in, at the consummation, the image of God will be fully restored and we will properly function because the substantial and habitual aspects of the image will have been corrected and surpassed. The consummation is not a mere return to the garden, is what I'm saying. Through union with our Lord Jesus Christ, we will reflect the Shekinah glory of the indwelling spirit, the spirit of Christ himself. This forward and upward trajectory of life in the garden would be seen throughout redemptive history, or can be seen throughout the scriptures in the divinely ordained types and shadows that are embedded in the history of Israel, not merely the result of a creative imagination of a reader. The image of God would be perfectly exemplified in the person of Jesus Christ. As the writer to the Hebrews tells us, the sun is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and we've heard references to that passage already. So what does this all mean? Uh, I would like to suggest an analogy between the person and work of Jesus Christ on the one hand and our being made in and being the divine image. Many of us will be familiar with the critical New Testament scholarship which has tried to reduce New Testament statements clearly meant to convey to us something about the ontology or metaphysics of Jesus Christ, that is, who he was. That is, passages which reveal that the Son was preexistent, that he was sent by the Father, that he created and preserves all things, and that he is the end goal of all things in creation. These texts provide the bedrock for understanding his function or work of redemption. Jesus doesn't just act as if he was the Lord of all glory, beloved. He was and is. Jesus Christ was able to accomplish redemption and apply it through his Holy Spirit because he is the second person of the triune Godhead, not merely a, a human being who fulfilled that function on earth in his earthly ministry. In other words, we cannot separate Christ's person from his work. Assuredly, we can distinguish them, but we dare not tear them asunder. So also it is with being in and functioning as the divine image. While the divine image reaches its apex in our glory, glorifying and enjoying the triune God forever, there are things that must be true about us, substantially, I would say. And this is where I hate using a tablet because I just zipped back three or four pages. There we go. There are things that must be true about us to properly, for us to tr properly function as the divine image. We must be able to think and communicate and relate in order to be able to rule and have dominion and to do so in a godly manner that reflects God's own character, especially as that has been manifested in the person and work of his divine son. At the end of the day, to be predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son is to be restored to our fully functioning imaging capacity. That restoration begins in this life, although principially complete. And the image shines forth in the new heavens and the new earth where we will reflect the glory of the radiating Lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world. To be conformed to the image of the Son is to have the divine image fully and comprehensively restored and functioning in each of us individually and corporately as the people of God. Thank you.